Garden is uh, old German for enclosed space, Garten. And so it, it's a place that you want to enjoy, whether you're growing crops or whether you're doing pretty flowers and uh, mainly for aesthetics. So anyway, and a garden is supposed to enhance the structures in it, you know, the building. Landscape architects try to enhance uh, art. Uh, if you think about it, a building is a, is a work of art. And that's part of the art street. A lot of people don't think of a building as an artwork. And a lot of architects create magnificent structures that have lasted as works of art for a long time. So you don't want to hide it. You just want to enhance it. And, you know, but that's fine outdoors. But indoors, you want to look out. So I say, well, if you're in the kitchen, you've got your window open. I like to plant something like a Korean spice library, and that thing that will be out next week, that has an intense, magnificent fragrance. It's Korean spice library, one of the most fragrant plants in the, on earth. So it drifts in the window while they're drying dishes, or they're cooking. Um, something that, that creates interest all year, whether it's shape, whether it's color, flowering, fall color, that kind of thing. Um, does it have berries? Does it attract birds, um, butterflies, that kind of thing? So you, you, you want to uh, create things with uh, all season interest. We have plants here that were finished flowering in, in, in March. There's a little shrub, there's this big shrub here, and then next to it, the little one, it, there are two, two um, witch hazels. The little one flowered in March, and it's the, one of the very first plants to bloom after the snows, and you're looking for life. The other one, the native witch hazel, starts to flower in October, November, right through to Christmas, even into January. So there's something that when everybody says, thinks that everything is finished, here's something that's just coming into bloom. So those are some of the considerations. But then it's the balance, the structure. For example, here we have something very simple. There's bamboo and a bunch of ferns, and that's pretty well it. Very austere and simple. Here, you look out this window, and you have an evergreen of the balsam fir. You have striped maple, which if you look at closely, has beautiful stripes on the bark. Um, and then the ferns against that wall. So that's purposely done to be very sort of simple but effective so people can enjoy that view all the time. And in winter, you have the evergreen with the snow on it. You have the striped bark and the shape of the, of the maple. Okay? And then we have a holly over here which has red berries. So you get red, white with the snow, green with the evergreen, and the interesting shape. So those are some of the things you think about to create interest here. This could be, like Susan said, just lawn with stepping stone path through it. So we're trying to make it aesthetically pleasing and enjoyable to have the meal here. In fact, we had lunch in that corner.
plant. This is uh, another spice viburnum. That's uh, viburnum for woody eye. The other one is viburnum for something. And that's one of those the scented Excuse plants. Me. So people are sitting here in a nice warm day. You should be able to smell that fragrance. I have one outside my wife's bedroom. And you, know, you can smell the scent in the bedroom and up on our deck. So that's one of my so-called signature plants that I do in gardens where I use non-native things. But in a garden I design with native plants, you have that big tree in the corner, which is an alternate leaf dogwood. The one over there, straight through there, is viburnum um, uh, lentego or nanny berry. It has magnificent fall color. The, the alternately dogwood attracts uh, butterflies, a particular little blue. It has uh, berries, attracts birds, has a peachy burgundy fall color, and the most beautiful shape of any plant in the world. There are plants as nicely shaped. It's called pagoda dogwood. It has tiers of, of layer, layers of growth that taper like a, like a pagoda. Another plant I use is um, witch hazel, which we just talked about, okay? and then service berry or shad bush, which is down there. I have those in every garden I do as, as my signature that I did them. So back to some of the plants uh, here. We have Japanese flowering dogwood here, which will be flowering in June. And there's the native, uh, the native dogwood, the Asian one. We have um, the See the cow. Well, they have some typical stuff in here, like Forsythia with the yellow flowers. The yellow thing in the corner is Caria with the big uh, uh, yellow flowers there. It's Caria japonica. It's Korean. We have a holly here. This is a Japanese holly. And over near that pink tree flowering there, or the magenta tree, we have um, our native uh, winterberry holly. We have magnolia, which flowers. Uh, this is finished uh, pretty much two weeks ago. But there's the odd flower still hanging on here. We do have a native magnolia. We get the ugly one. Uh, and it is over on the other side. There's a selection of it called yellowbird. Uh, there's another garden, a Zen garden, is hopefully going in on the other side. And it's in bloom. You'll see that later. So there's a oriental magnolia and the, the uh, Occidental. Does anybody know where those words came from? Why is it called the Orient? We just did this at lunch. It's what I always did with my students. Why is it called the Orient? Because the, word, the, 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 the root of, of Orient is, the, is a Latin verb to rise, Orientera. Okay? So the sun rises in the east. The Occident, Akadera, means to fall. So the sun falls in the west. So that's why we have the Orient and the Occident. OK, a little bit of a learning experience here. <laughs> so um, we try to balance things. But one of the, the interesting things here is um, I planted ginkgo. It's a living fossil. Remember, it's one of those trees. It's millions and millions of years unchanged. Um, fossil ginkgo leaves are almost identical to, to the modern ginkgo, and it was monks in China that saved it from extinction. They also saved uh, dawn redwood, and it was only discovered in the in the 19th uh, or early 18th or early 20th century. These living fossils, so they're very important, and that was meant to be the largest tree in the garden. But this selection of ginkgo is a is a is a little weird dwarfy thing that's not <laughs> growing. So I, I, did, I don't want to upset the Chinese you know, for political reasons. They want a, a big presence in this garden. There's a nicer ginkgo on the other side. So that's where the big ginkgo will be. If you go to any garden east, uh, in the east, ginkgo is the big tree, big monster things, 100, you know, 150 feet high. But here is the katsura. Was, was, was meant to be in the shade of that, and it's just gone totally nuts. 
And I always like the Katsura. I mean, it's a very important forest tree in the, in, in the east. But to me, it's a uh, red bud that didn't make it. Because that purple uh, magenta flowering tree over there is the leaves are almost identical to Katsura, except look what we get with our native red bud. <laughs> and by the way, there is an Asian red bud as well. Here's China's emblem, the uh, tree peony. Okay. And we have uh, Korea, are those three shrubs there, which is uh, Hibiscus syriacus and uh, lots of cherry. We'll see a Japanese cherry over there. Here's a beautiful crab apple, an oriental crab apple. So maybe we'll go this way uh, this time. And we have uh, ground covers, epimedium is Asian. Uh, Japanese spurge, and we also have in here a little bit of the native spurge, uh, which is from the Allegheny Mountains in the, in the U.S. This is not supposed to be here. This is actually European. We don't want any European elements here. Actually, so is the lily of the valley. Um, they're weeds, but the people are attached to this, and they won't let me get rid of it. <laughs> unfortunately, but we can arrange for it to die. But anyway, here is a Carolina silver bell, which I think is uniquely North American, Halesia. And this, come to see this in another uh, week or so. And unfortunately, they really damaged it with the new loosening facing on the building. And they sheared the whole side of this off. And it hasn't recovered well. Uh, Korean fur. So this is a Korean fir. The one in the corner I talked about over there is, is balsam fir, which is Canadian. This is Susan's favorite plant, the anemone canadensis. It's a, it's a disgusting weed, but I, it doesn't bother me. And in amongst it is the Japanese anemone. So there are the two, two anemone species. We have, um, did you say that piece of sweet shrub for chance? This is a plant called Carolina Allspice or Sweet Shrub, and it's related to magnolia. You can see the flowers. But it has a really interesting fragrance. Uh, this is Exocorda uh, here, which is oriental. This fern, by the way, is one that's found identically in Asia and North America, the ostrich fur. Okay, pass that around and, and smell that. <laughs> and some of you may know Judy Chawinski, but she's retiring, and this is the plant she contributed to the garden. So a lot of the plants here came from direct buying. Um, a lot of friends and Susan and I have donated stuff to the garden. Uh, a lot of it has come from graduating classes or people that have died, as a, planted as memorials to people who died. Um, so you know that's how we're getting these things. So Judy Jawinski, who retires um, in June, this will be in full bloom for her retirement service, her ceremony, um, and her office used to be out here. That's why this plant is here. So this is a very rare plant in the Waterloo. This is Styrax, and it will be just a total mass of pink, like little fuchsias, pink fuchsias. Come to see this when it's blooming. It's magnificent. We have Japanese tree lilac. This is going to be spectacular, just starting to set the bud. We have all kinds of viburnums, we have all kinds of lilac, we have, um, here's the service berry. This has a beautiful shape, it had, it's finished flowering, so it's early. It has clusters of black, blue-ish fruit, reddish fruit that are absolutely delicious. So when this is ready, eat them. <laughs> we, we've made sure there aren't any real toxic plants in here because we don't want kids to 
So that's another consideration in the garden. You, you don't want to put poisonous things like poison ivy and stuff in here. Here we have a, a paper bark maple, which is an Asian maple. It's Chinese, Asian Chrysium. See how the peel the bark peels off of it. We This is interesting because uh, a lot of gardens in the Orient have a gate, an entry feature. And we had an entry feature built. It's called a Toryu gate. And what happened was it had the classic Toryu gate structure. And so otherwise it was an authentic Toryu gate. But what happened was somebody objected to it being here because they're only used as entrances to sacred spaces. And this is not a sacred space. So we had to change it um, so it would comply with looking like a, a real Toyo gate but wasn't offensive as because it really isn't an interest to us, uh, uh, access to a, a sacred space like a temple or a shrine. So that was interesting. But we've had a lot of stuff donated. This magnificent uh, lantern is beautifully done. It's real granite. And uh, you can see some of the signage uh, some of the donations have come from. Uh, we have Nick Reese. Nick Reese is a graduate of this program. And he did the, the mushroom lantern. I think it's very nice uh, and unique. Custom, it was custom co uh, co uh, uh, commission for the garden. This is Canada's, uh, this is Ontario's emblem, the uh, white pine. A white pine is pine astrobus. That's supposed to be straight, eventually getting 150 feet high. They were stamped by the royal crowns of, of England and France for ship mass and the death penalty. There was a death penalty if you cut one down. But this is the one that we have, which is kind of struggling and going all over the place, just like our government in Ontario. <laughs> anyway, we won't be too political. Um, here's the dry stream bed effect. This bridge is the second version. The first version had, um, it was uh, not the right angle. It wasn't deemed handicapped, uh, uh, f uh, friendly, and this actually turned out to be a, a much nicer design in the end. So that was rebuilt. And of course, other things you take for granted are benches and waste containers, but that's stuff all important for a garden. And the paths are partly done related to student movement. There's no point putting paths down and planting stuff, I mean, put planting stuff that just, you know, people will trample. So what you want to do is, is, is start with a blank slate and let people walk around for a while to show you where they want to go and then put the paths in. So it's a, it's a, good, uh, a good strategy. This is Hinoki Dwarf Cypress, which is a very sacred tree in Japan, a Korean boxwood. This tree is North, North American, uh, it's a robinia. It's a black locust from eastern North America, and there are counterparts in uh, China as well of it. These plants just went in less than two hours ago. The juniper, Fother gilla is a beautiful North American plant related to witch hazel, and I, point, I think I pointed out the tree peonies. So we just planted seven things here between the two classes. Okay, so we'll go over the bridge. Susan, the um, 
Mayapple's really doing well. That thing with the umbrella-like leaves over there. It's the weeping cypress from, uh, from uh, British Columbia. And I think that really hits it well because there's Nootka weeping cypress and then we saw the, the uh, Korean cypress there. So remember they were linked. There's British Columbia and that's Korea over there. So it shows that separation and the species uh, being pulled apart. Here's the holly I mentioned earlier. Oh, the, the poppy's coming up. I want you to do is smell the Korean spice viburnum over there. We have several species of it. It's, it's, it's every garden I do, I, I usually use native plants, uh, being president of the Canadian Wildflower Society at one point. But at my own garden now, um, my friends will never talk to me because I'm starting to use things I've liked all my life. And every garden I design has that in it. It has the tree behind, which is alternate leaf dogwood, okay? It has nanny berry, which is a viburnum against the wall there, um, the one to the left. So all three of those plants are in. I also have service berry, which we'll show you down there, and um, alternate leaf dog, service berry, witch hazel, okay? Those are my signature plants. So if you go to any garden I've designed in the city, probably 10 or 12 in town, you'll see those plants in there. And then they're native. And then magnolia is finished. There's a few flowers left here. One star magnolia. Magnolia is interesting because it's one of the it, it's one of the longest living What's that's word? Um, it's been around longer than almost any other plant species. They evolved 250 million years ago, virtually unchanged um, in the Cretaceous period, and it's one of the first plants that started to have petals. The plants back then weren't, they didn't have showy flowers. They were ugly little fern-like things, and you know, they were big. The ferns were trees, and you know, that kind of thing. They were the dominant plants, uh, club mosses. And, horse tails and that kind of thing. Then something happened. They said, ooh, let's look pretty and attract something to pollinate us. So this goes back a long time. Um, so talking the east-west thing here. We showed you the two dogwoods, I mean the two witch hazels. Here we have the two dogwoods, Japanese, Chinese flowering dogwood, and like I said, the, the uh, alternate leaf dogwood. We have Viburnums, which are, uh, oh sorry, uh, yeah, viburnum here, Korean, North American. We have uh, dogwood, another dogwood species there, uh, red osier dogwood. We have holly. We don't have, we have uh, uh, Japanese holly here, and over here we have a North American holly that we'll go to later. We have ginkgo. Ginkgo is one of the, a, a fossil tree where, again, there are fossils of ginkgo leaves and there's a tree still surviving. The, the monks, Buddhist monks, worshiped the trees, had them in their gardens, and, and, and they were discovered in the, in the 19th century. They were thought to be extinct, just like that tree they discovered in uh, Sydney, near Sydney. I mean, they, they, followed that, they discovered an extinct tree it's extinct for hundreds of millions of years, and here it is living outside Sydney, Australia. And that tree, the Wollamy pine, is actually hardy. I, I, I see them in France, in Paris. Uh, they have them in front of their paleontology museum where the dinosaurs are. 
So, and then the other living fossil tree is Metasequoia, Don Redwood, and it's on the other side in front of the library. So those are our iconic plants. Katsura is, is a forest tree, one of the most common trees in, in Asia, and there it is. We also have, uh, on the other side, there's another ginkgo, we have Zelkova. Zelkova is basically, replaces elm here in Asian ecosystems. So we have uh, Liriope here, lily turf, and we have Epimedia, which are Asian. I've seen these in the forests in, in Japan, from looking up the forest, magnificent. And then we have Canada anemone here, Susan's favorite plant. All in amongst it is Japanese anemone. So you're getting a sense now of what the garden is all about. Here's China's emblem, tree peony. Wait till you see those bloom in another week or two. These we're planting. Susan and Daryl, they've donated money to maintain the garden, which is very important because a lot of gardens are designed and then they just fall apart and go to weeds because nobody cares for them. some of the evergreen elements. We have um, Nootka weeping cypress, that's from British Columbia. And we have some junipers. We've got North American and, and uh, Asian junipers. Uh, Japanese maple over here. Red bud. There's, a, there's again Asian red buds. And there are North American red buds. That's the North American red bud. The Asian ones aren't hard in here, unfortunately. Um, crab apple. Uh, Japanese, we have Korean fur, and then setting up, oh, this is going to be spectacular this year, so we put all the cones on the top. This, we have uh, Forsythia over there, um, which is finished flowering, the, the common yellow plant, some of you will know. In the, the one that's blooming right now back there, the yellow, is, is uh, Katsura, I mean, sorry, Caria, Caria, in the corner, the big yellow flowers in there. Um, this plant is, I think, the only one I know of in Kitchener-Waterloo. This is a uh, Korean uh, pink forsythia, a belliophyllum. It bloomed, when did this bloom? In March. Ah, uh, very early. Beautiful pink flowers, just massive, massively beautiful. There's an ornamental onion there, boxwood, Korean. The Hinoki cypress is Japanese, dwarf Hinoki cypress. The black locust is uh, probably going to go someday, unfortunately, but it's getting too old and decrepit. But it's a North American plant. It's not native to Canada, but it is in the US. And you go to France, you go to the botanical gardens in France. Robin is the one who it's named for. It's called Robinia. And you can see the plant that was brought, the first plant discovered is planted at the Paris Botanical Gardens and it's hundreds and hundreds of years old, 300 years old, it's still there. Um, all, the, all the hostas here, we have all the different kinds of hostas. They're a very good ground cover. You can see those fluffy things there. Uh, the other thing that makes the garden and a comment I'll never forget is one of the faculty members here said, you know, once we put the Toru Gate in, the Half Moon Bridge, and the lanterns, he said, it now is a garden. Up until then, it was a bunch of plants. And is that, I thought that was really interesting on the first part of the because that is what makes this an oriental garden, of these uh, hard landscape details, the structures. We 
envisioned a tea house that could come somewhere <coughs> on the other side. So here we have Korea's emblem. doesn't do well because it likes cold. You know, everybody talks about planting things in their gardens and they say, oh, will it winter? <laughs> okay? You also have to think the other way. Will it summer? And that's why global climate change is such a scary thing for the plants that have nowhere to go anymore in the north, okay, or animals. It gets too hot. They're trying to keep cool. Where can they go? Okay, drown. So, for example, in, in, in Louisiana, our yellow lady slipper, they've given up trying to protect it. It's just too hot now. It's not
sweet truck on Calacanthus. Uh, well, I'll take a flower. Here's a flower out. It's related to magnolia. You see, it's much like magnolia. I'm going to crush one of these, and then you can. from Greg Michalenko. Shrub doesn't look like much. This whole area has it's, it's, it's really had a rough time. Every time we plant something, the, it, the, the rabbits get it or people walk over it, whatever. This is one of my absolute favorite plants. This is Thomas Jefferson's favorite tree, actually. This is Calic uh, This is um, Chiananthus. Uh, and it will have frothy white flowers, just like a, a beard, just masses of flower. And it's one of the most expensive things we've acquired, and it's just been abused and messed up with. And, uh, we had um, oxydendron here, sourwood, which is the only one that's in the water here at the time. And it's something when they built the new building. The, the persimmon. Oh, what have they done? The persimmon, this khaki, this khaki, this persimmon was had a rough time. The um, yellow wood, the banana is there. We're not going to spend time much in this garden, but this is my new dream garden. But there's a magnolia. This is a, actually a native magnolia, a, a cultivar of our native magnolia. And then we have Cydonia, which is quince, the real quince. Any any hint of the um, Susan? Any Susan? Is there any hint of the banana coming up? I think it's too early. But anyway, this garden is our next one. Okay, this is the one I really am looking forward to doing as a as a as a very very Zen contemplation garden. And Daryl's plant is over there. It's, it's a bristle cone pine. So we're not going to be talking about it. That noise is so frightening. Canada, Canada's floral emblem right here. So we have 
have to have it, of course, the most uh, uh, emblematic uh, fossil. Well, here's another one from that same period, and this is Metasequoia or Dawn Redwood. And again, that's planted to contrast against that blank brick wall. And you notice we're not putting tall stuff to block the views from the windows. So again, part of the design. And this one I've done perfectly for people. This is Seven Brothers Street. Uh, seven Brothers tree, and some of the bicyclists have broken a piece, and if I knew whose bike it was, I would break their bike. But anyway, okay, um, the bike isn't living, but this is. Okay, this blooms in September. When you all come back to school, look at this tree. After the summer, you'll see it blooming. And not much stuff blooms that late in the season. So that's purposely done for people to appreciate. There are a few jokes here. Um, on the other side, we're not going to go to the full extent of the garden. Um, I have uh, two gum trees. I have sweet gum, which is um, North American, and there's also Asian as well, counterpart, and then I have sour gum. So that's a tribute to number 56 on a Chinese restaurant menu, sweet and sour, whatever, chicken balls. So that's a joke over there. Um, so maybe we can end with that. <laughs> um, so any questions? Yeah? Have you ever been enticed by the notion of, of, of composing a garden out of uh, the, the, the specimens found on the island of Sicatra? Uh, on the island of which? Of Sicatra. It's off the coast of Yemen. It's known for its very, uh, very different biodiversity. Okay. Like it, it, there are plants that are like no other plants in Yeah, well, that, well there, there are all kinds of centers like that. Madagascar is a classic. Or South Africa and Australia, you know, there, there's centers of that um, kind of expression, ecological expression, in the world. Even the Great Lakes, there's a lot of endemics that are, are unique, just specifically to that area. So I think I recognize the name of, the, but that's tropical, isn't it? Yeah. So how can we do that? Now, if they do a campus down there, hey, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. And the funny thing, too, it would be fun. I've always joked the, the next step here is to bring in the animal life. Wouldn't it be nice to have Chinese snow monkeys and Jap <laughs> Japanese snow monkeys here? They could write your papers. They could do, your, you know, do the lawns and maintain the plants. So, you know, there's, 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 there's fun things. A panda. <laughs> you know. I mean, you know, see, they have a, a, a moose as the as their mascot here. So the East Asian program, they should have a panda <laughs> as well. So see, two of them. So there's the next development. The next building I can see is the panda area. Um, okay, no, that's a good question. What, and and the, the other thing that I'm, I'm, I like to do, and I, I bring it up as a hint, is there's, a, there's potential for uh, Islamic um, East Asian garden here to some extent, because there are certain uh, plants from Persia. I have uh, paratia at home, which is a relative of witch hazel in my garden. Um, there is potential for even winter hardy olive here. Um, so there are emblematic plants, but the problem with the Mediterranean uh, is we, it's too cold here. It, it could be, if you want to see a, a, one of the finest Mediterranean gardens, um, have a lot of East Asian, uh, East, uh, 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 Middle Eastern plants, what I'm trying to think of, is, in, in, is the Royal Botanical Gardens in Hamilton. They purposely did a Mediterranean garden, which is very, very nice. 
but there are certain things that you can use um, to create sort of a uh, like the red bud to create a, a Middle Eastern garden effect. So that's a thought. So claim a space. Yeah, we can do it. I like to do is grow stuff that you can't grow here because it's too cold. But uh, some some things. I have a friend in town. He just he he he, he has tangerine. He has bougainvillea, Natal plum, palm trees that are winter hardy. Just by a layer of, of, of plastic over his uh, from his, covering his front porch. But it's, it's unbelievable what what he's done. Okay, so a lot of the plants here too are, are, are meant to attract birds, butterflies, not necessarily geese, but anyway, you're going to get them anywhere. I always said if you stand long enough in one spot, it will nest on you. Okay. Um, and by the way, there are many concepts for oriental gardens. The garden I'm working with is a stroll garden. and. It's meant to be uh, a nice walk where you see surprises like a bridge or a, a nicely placed rock. By the way, rock placement is extremely important in gardens. And, and if you know some of the gardens in Japan, some of their rocks are national treasures. People travel all from, well, I went to Rio Anji to see the 13 rocks placed in that garden. Uh, but Dyson N has a, guard, a rock that's a national treasure in Japan, and they're placed, you can't move them one millimeter without them being totally different and ruin the effect. You have to be very, very um, skilled to place guard rocks there. But also, there's a Zen garden, which is meant for contemplation. I just read about one last night, uh, just incidentally, it's actually a European it's in Europe, but it's an oriental garden, and it's meant to symbolize life. So you walk through the garden with the beginnings of life, and it's a topiary garden, and you end with the chair that the gardener died on in his own garden, which I thought was really, really touching. Um, and there are some spectacular effects I would like to do here. Um, with the uh, one garden in Japan, I'd like to have seen 30,000 hydrangeas. You know those things you sell at Easter with the pink, white, and purple and blue flower bushes, which is the brown head? 30,000 of them, all in the understory that you walk around. They're all blooming at once. I would like to do roses, tree peonies, a garden of hundreds of tree peonies, just to see that it would be a, 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 a something people could travel to see. So I think we have to thank a lot of people for this, Daryl and Susan, for endowing this. Um, I think the people who have made the donations, uh, the ground staff have been very good here in maintaining this. Um, Susan and I spent a lot of time traveling around. In fact, those plants you just saw over there, as soon as this class is over, I'm running to the car for the shovels and the planting. So people have made donations, like I said, of the, the, the things like the benches even, the waste containers. All of that stuff is important. So if any of you are interested in, in, in the garden at all, you could, who would they see? Him, because he's here, we're retired. And you can uh, help. Are you suggesting I drive him or give a donation? I don't know, they don't have to do that. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that magnolia you saw, what, the magnolia was, uh, that was a class, wasn't it? Yes, it was a graduating class. Uh, class that yeah. donated it. Yeah. And I always hate to say this, but um, no, I'm not going to say it because it'll come back on me. But some of the donations here are memorial plants. And anyway, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> 
Okay, no questions, no more questions or okay. Well I hope some of you choose the uh Somebody's going to come in here and say, oh, a baby's going to fall through here and die. So we have to close this off with wire and rods, so just don't invite that person here. But anyway, so it was, it was too steep an angle. It, of course, everything has to be, you know, fairly for handicap access today. So we don't want people tripping. Um, I've avoided some of the poisonous plants. Um, I'd love to use Daphne Mesoraeum here. Some kids could eat the berries and croak. Um, so, so we have to be careful that you know there's all kinds of those. Of course, you know, poison ivy makes a wonderful ground cover. It's a native plant, um, beautiful fall color, nice berries for birds. But I don't think people would want poison ivy in here. So anyway, so anyway, that bridge had to be destroyed, and this went in its place. like a water feature, something like an upstanding rock. A cami stone is missing here. Uh, we could call that a cami stone. Cami stone links heaven and earth. It bridges the gap between heaven and earth. And in the morning garden, there's a sculpture that was perfectly designed as the cami stone. And it's a rough grouse because Bob Warney, the garden is done for. Uh, it is doctrine. Thanks. 
something I would like to do here, a, a basalt column, a six-sided basalt column with water bubbling out of it from that other guard. People can stroll here, play over there, and, and be religious in that other guard over there. Okay, so I give you some thoughts for themes and yes, thank you very ideas. Much. Well, enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't mention borrowed scenery. That's a very important concept in oriental gardening, is they, they design an intimate space, but they also pull in the view in the distance with the mountains and the bigger trees and the structures. That's a very important uh, consideration for the borrowed landscape. It's Jerome Mountain. That's a little bit, um, yeah. <laughs> It's kind of, it's, it's wanting. <laughs> you know, for a, for a Catholic uh, connection, it's, it's not Baroque. <coughs> they need some curly cues and <laughs> stuff on it, mm -hmm. color. Yeah. When I went to Finland um, and I saw the Temple Alco church, the famous church that's hewn out of granite, the Finnish architect in Helsinki. It's magnificent, modern, of course, Lutheran as it could be. And then I went in there and I said, I can tell it's not Catholic. There's no gold seams in the granite. <laughs> okay, let's not end on religion. Oh, they're going that way now. Okay. So are we to get the shovels. Oh, by the way, I, I heard rumors that uh, next week, Tuesday's class is supposed to be the Monday class. Did you hear this? The Monday classes are scheduled for Tuesday, so I guess we don't meet next Tuesday. Did you hear that? That's right. That's true? I was wondering, while you've got your captive here, if that wouldn't be a good day. Do you have classes, Monday classes on Tuesday, anybody? Some people do. Oh, that's a shame, because what I was going to suggest is we could catch up with the uh, writing process and the pre-writing by holding uh, an illicit class. <laughs> but I guess we can if some people would miss it. So I guess we'll make that up at the end of July. So I just thought I'd mention that now. It's on our schedule. I'll have to wipe it out, which means I'll be even further behind. You hear the cardinal in the distance there.